This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. Now prepare yourselves for a Starship Sabres and Scoundrels special edition. Scoundrels and Star Wars fans, and welcome to this Scoundrels Special Edition. I'm Dennis Keekley, and with me are my friends and co-hosts Jay Krebs and Darth Taxus. Well, hello, hello, hello. We're back once again to talk about Resistance. Super excited about this episode. I'm not Jay. I'm the other I'm Jay. Guy. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's Jay. That's right. I guess we should have clarified that. Hi, Scoundrels. This is Jay. You can call her Jay, and you can not call me Jay. So, on this Scoundrel Special Edition, uh, which is a bonus episode of Starship Savers and Scoundrels, we are going to be foregoing our usual news and listener reaction segments to concentrate on a specific piece of content, which, as Jay just alluded to, is the latest episode of Resistance, the Doza Dilemma. Yeah. And so, uh, if you are uh, want to catch up on the news and stuff, then check out our... Um, episodes that have a round number or, or, you know, 72, 73, something like that. But, uh, so let's get to it. This is a full spoiler discussion. Taxes, please hit that spoiler. Gladly. Scoundrels, if you are still here, you've been warned. So, the episode starts with, uh, Kragen, Gore, and Commander Pyre having a whole conference. Pyre is not happy that Kragen has really failed to exert enough pressure on Colossus Station. And, to which Kragen is kind of saying they're putting up a tougher resistance than, uh, no pun intended, than what we thought, <laughs> and this is going to cost you more money. Uh, Pyre agrees, but he tells Kragen that he's going to have to steal something from Doza uh, for the First Order. Now, I don't know about the two of you, but it wasn't terribly surprising to me that this turns out to be uh, Tora that they're going to have to kidnap. Well, just basically from, you know, I guess the, the title of the episode was a dead giveaway there. But yeah, it, it does make sense because, you know, they've been trying to kind of get an in with Doza anyways. And, and what better way to use some leverage than something he cares about most? Right. Oh, yeah. I wasn't surprised. I mean, the first thing I think about when I'm trying to, like, steal something precious somebody is their children. This is a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. You've been in that position what? before, I take it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh... No, I was never successful. Kragen then uh, next contact Sonara in order to repair the rival of a pair of fire pirates, which turns out to be Valak and Drell. Uh, quick note, Valak, the female pirate, if you notice, she looked an awful lot like Ara Singh, and that's mm-hmm. because she happens to be the same race. Now, I didn't know this prior to seeing this on the um, Resistance uh, page on StarWars.com, but that race is called uh, Paladavon. And uh, right. so, yeah, that's what it's called. Huh. Uh, but the, I was always in the impression, and I guess maybe this is more of a Legends thing, that the um, for Ara Singh, that she kind of had that spike sticking out of her head, that that was like a uh, implant of some sort. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I'm getting the impression that that's actually organic. Really? Because mm-hmm. I always thought it was an implant as well. Yeah. 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 What but makes Valak you think it's organic? Yeah, I always well, thought it was Valak more like whole... a uh, Valak symbol. Well, it was like, um, I thought, it, well, Valak Thank had you. a whole series of these spikes going over the top of her head, and they looked more like horns that were coming out. Right. But uh, but the um, I know back in Legends, it was, uh, it was kind of like a receptor that allowed her to sense the fear and anguish of the people she was hunting. Uh, and I can't remember, but one of the Jedi, it may have been Anakin in one of the comics, like sliced it off with his lightsaber. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So it didn't look like an antenna, like something you would like pull up, yeah. you know, like a CB or something like that. You well, know. I, yeah, I mean, some sort of a transmitter, uh, yeah, but, uh, but then, boy. Uh-huh. Yeah, ahead, I'm just wondering if the Paladuvans, if they utilize something like this, almost like like tattoos, you know what I mean? It's almost like an accessory in some ways, and it's just a culturally acceptable thing because Valak had, hers was more like a mohawk. Exactly. But it kind of, you know, almost even reminded me of, um, you know, like a Zabrak in a way. Hmm. Yeah, so. that's, that's what I was thinking as well. I mean, and <laughs> not the best comparison, but... After I read that on StarWars.com, I was beginning to think of like narwhals that have that huge one single tux oh. that comes out looks like a horn. Um, and uh, like I said, I don't know. I was just trying to think of 
you know, for Star Wars races, you know, why is it that our thing has the one single one, but Valak has this whole series of them that go over the top of her head? So, you know, to your suggestion, Jay, perhaps it is some sort of a a personal uh, statement of some kind that's being made there. I don't know, but regardless, there she is. And then uh, the other pirate, Drell, is another weak way um, yeah, in yeah. the series. But uh, so, like weird earrings possibly but Kragen tells Sonara that she needs to prepare for the arrival that she's going to have to get them through the docks and customs so to speak and eventually get them into Doza's tower um, and then you know basically Kragen promises like you know after this is done we're going to get paid a whole lot of money and you can come home and Sonara is visibly torn by all of this uh, because um, she's you know she's well we're going to find out in our next scene that she, she's playing darts um, at uh, Auntie Z's Cantina with uh, Tora, Kaz, and Tam, and after which they all head back to Tora's place to play a new Drone Blaster game, which to me looked like a combination of the uh, remotes that were aboard the Millennium Falcon that Luke Skywalker was fighting, and then Duck Hunt from the old yeah. Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Or a Saturday night with my Glock. Oh, and there you have it. There's a reason why I haven't been to your house yet. <laughs> uh, there, there's a lot of patchwork to do, so thank you. But uh, Tora and Tam were actually pretty good at this game. Sonara was amazing. She hit all the targets in five shots, five <laughs> targets in five shots. I mean, Kaz didn't hit a single one. Okay, so uh, can may I interject? I was a little surprised that he didn't hit something because, I mean, he's a pilot, right? I mean, the hand-eye coordination thing, don't, wouldn't you think uh, that he would be kind of a natural? Well, I, okay, I agree with you. I was surprised. Uh, but then I was thinking back, and he hasn't handled a blaster that many times in this series. And I was trying to remember a time that he actually did anything particularly proficient when he did. Mm. He and shot think, the one control panel to, sh- to close the yeah. door. when he. See, that's that was about thing. the only time. And I think that was more, more by accident than anything else. Will of right. You know, you know T- uh, Tam makes that ma- you know that remark that you know you couldn't hit the broadside of a freighter or something like that. But the uh, but you know I'll say this: I've seen enough people that um, have some sort of dexterity doing one thing that end up being completely lousy at archery. Um, you know because you know that's one of my hobbies. So I- I'm not sure. Texas, I agree. I was surprised that he was that lousy a shot, but. Um, but I'm not certain that just because he's a good pilot that it necessarily translates. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, can we back up for just a second and just sure. appreciate the fact no. that um, Tora says, this game is so wizard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When <laughs> I heard that, I know. I was like, <laughs> I, I, I totally, I knew. It's like I said, I knew you were going to lab head that. Oh, oh to- You know, yeah. like sit up straight. Because I did the same 100%. thing. I said, yeah, <laughs> I, my ears are like forward and I'm like, okay. So, yeah, and I'm going to have to pull that yeah. as a drop. Yeah. And this is actually, you know, if you think about it, this is the second kind of roundabout reference to the Phantom Menace that we're getting in this episode. Because we, you know, we've got a, a very, you know, focused view of Valak. And who is, you know, very similar to Aura Singh, Phantom Menace. And then we've got, oh, yeah, yeah. this is so wizard. Hmm. You know, I, I don't know. Coincidence? Well, <laughs> I think not. <laughs> yeah, this I know. Is, I'm just looking one of the for strengths of, It's been one of the strengths of this series is that they do draw from everything. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, Taraj Ka, the, you know, from the um, Dangerous Business episode was Isn't the I? alien that was in The Last Jedi. Uh, and they've yeah. done a great job of pulling in from all corners uh, of the of the series. And there's another reference that we'll get to in just a bit. That when it showed up, I was like, "Oh, that was awesome! I'm so glad that they brought it in." But uh, but so they're they're playing this game in Tora's room in the in the tower, and she basically tells them, "It's like, hey, you guys, you come over anytime." They they've developed quite a friendship, and mm-hmm. she says, "Just use my access codes." Which as soon as she said that, I was like, <laughs> "Oh no, you didn't." <laughs> Yeah, because uh, yeah. you know, you know, Sonara set up a little bit straighter uh, when that happened, and you know that those codes were going to come into play. with what she's got to do. Um, so from there, we get to a scene where Doza is having a call with Commander Pyre, and Pyre is pressuring him for uh, basically an answer to the First Order's proposal to provide provide security and 
he slanders the ace pilots there. He's like, you know, you can't have this station defended by racers, which to some degree has been a little bit of a criticism of ours, um, you know, because it's it's mainly been it's not so much that these about the racers. It's just that the setup of this base that you got these people that are there to um, defend the station. But really, for the most part, we saw them doing a lot of racing. And then later we got to see them escorting ships in. But it was kind of a how this series was built. And you know, it's not, you know, it was billed as kind of um, Star Wars racers. And then, you know, but then why was it called Resistance? And now we find out that these were people that they're really their primary job is to provide security and then they race in their off time. Uh, but yeah, because uh, yeah, they're not going off on a circuit or nothing. You know what I mean? Uh, exactly. They're like just hanging out at the station. If there happens to be a race there, then, oh, okay, I'll join in, you know? And. I gotta admit, I was kind of annoyed that he called that he slandered them like that. <laughs> I was, I was like, uh, you know, it's not that any of these racers outside of Tora have had a whole lot of screen time and an opportunity to re- develop real personalities on the show. I mean, I guess, uh, um, what's his face? The um, uh, the um, watermelon hype Fajon. Thank you. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, you know, he's he's had a he's had an episode, but. Um, Frigga and uh, the TIE Fighter pilot and those, you know, some of them and then there's the uh, Keldor. Now, those guys have barely had any lines in this series. Uh, but still, I don't know, I just kind of, the uh, the slander towards the Ace pilots annoyed me. What did you all think? Well, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I'm just waiting for the time where they they're not just a side character kind of thing. You know what I mean? Right. That there's more of a, a sensible purpose to, you know, who they are, why they're there, you know, that kind of thing. So I do feel like Ka- that Kaz is going to become part of the Aces at some point, though. Oh, I feel like it's been headed in that direction for yeah. a long time. Yeah. It's just, and it's, yeah. I'm, I'm honestly surprised that it we're hasn't not there happened. yet. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they um, totally, like, laid the groundwork for the past couple episodes because he's been, like, up first. You know what I mean? Or jumping into the fray. And, uh, you know, oh, okay, so the mask dude, the guy that never takes his helmet off, that's like a Keldor, that's like, uh, what's his name? The, um... Plo Koon? The, well, you do what you like in your own time, but, yeah. That's who I was thinking of. So, that's who he is? Yeah, he's a Keldor. Right. Okay, so, because I was wondering, that, I was like, you know, I just realized he never takes his mask off, so... Well, I can't remember what he said during this episode, but it had a similar modulation yes. to his voice, like yeah. Clo Coons. Yeah, uh, but because yeah. uh, he's one of the two pilots, that ends up kind of uh, they get they find the distraction. But again, we're getting ahead of ourselves, right? Right. Um, but Dozer responds to Pyre that he wants more time. Uh, Tora interrupts, you know, because she's excited to tell her dad about how much fun she just had with Cam, Taz, and. See, I did it again. Tam, Kaz, and Sonara. Uh, and, you know, he's kind of like, eh, this isn't the time. But, uh, you know, as he ends the discussion, with, uh, I'm sorry, Captain Doza ends the conversation with Pyre. So we get to the uh, garage, Jaeger's garage, and um, they're kind of finishing up some chores. I love the bit with BB-8 going up to the closet, that bucket. Yeah. <laughs> he stores himself in and he oh, taps yeah. on the door and then runs off real quick. Uh, and then Buck, uh, Buck comes out and chases him around a little bit. I, you know, BB-8, he's one of these characters that he, like, disappears for huge portions of episodes, but then he shows up and he makes an impact. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I and I just loved his little bit there where, you know, he's, I don't know, kind of, he's being impish, I guess, maybe out of boredom or something. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but did you all notice that when um, next to that little shed or on the door of that shed, there was an illustration of Chopper? No, I didn't until I looked at the buckets list and I really studied that picture. And I also saw, <laughs> did you see the little picture of Bitey on there too, on the other part yeah. of the door? Uh-huh. So yeah, that the was, board. that was really yeah. cool. But yeah, I didn't notice that until then. So I'm glad that I looked at those up close. So why would I didn't that notice be on it that? The first time. I think it's just supposed to be an Easter egg, but the, uh, oh. I didn't notice it the first time, but then um, one of my kids was watching the episode uh, yesterday and when that door flew open, I saw it right there. I was like, oh, it's a chopper. So that was pretty Good cool. Good eye. Hmm. But um, so Tam, you know, s- suggests to Kaz that, hey, we're done here. Why don't we go find Jaeger? Maybe he'll find his dinner, which was cool and a little bit heartbreaking um, that, you know, they they just don't have much money. And so someone buying them dinner like that would be that big a deal. 
yes. uh, for them. But uh, Kaz turns down this idea because he wants to go. He now he uses an excuse. He wants to go back to the salvage yard and see if Sonara's got any more parts they can use. Yeah, but brown Tam's not cool. Brown cow. He said, you know, she says, no, you want to just go see Sonara, and then any. Fesses right up to it that yeah he would mind go spending some more time with her yeah. and this is something that we kind of called uh, mm-hmm. back in the Bebo episode oh yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right that's right nature calls but, uh, now that's hot you're making this creepy dude uh, but he gets yeah, down man. there and he spots Sonara um, talking to Valak and Drell so they've just kind of uh, gotten out of their container mm-hmm. and so he follows him over to Doza's tower and basically, we get to this position where they're there to kidnap Tora. It becomes obvious uh, when they show up in Tora's room. Okay, so before well, I'm getting ahead of myself, this is the reference I was talking about. As they're sneaking through the tower, they pulled out a droid popper, which was made uh, famous during the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. And they throw it out into the middle of four of the security droids in it, or I think it was five, actually. Yeah. And it knocks them offline. And that was just, I don't know, that was a cool callback. What did you all think? Oh, yeah, definitely. And again, I didn't realize that was exactly what it was until I looked back and watched that on Bucket's List. And I thought, oh, yeah, okay, that's what that was. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, there's so yeah. many little things like that that, I mean, there's just so much in Star Wars that it's it's hard for my, my brain pan to keep it all in there. I always say that my brain is more like a colander than anything else. Some things stay in and some things kind of filter out. So yeah. Um, yeah, that was cool. Yeah, back in the Clone Wars, a lot of droids used to love to um, party with some droid poppers. All right. Well, the um, <laughs> I think they actually called it one. And the reason why it caught my attention so quick is because after we did our um, the revisit of uh, the uh, Clone Wars review that we did in episode 72, I had watched a few more episodes and there was a droid popper that was used. And then it made oh. the same sound. Uh, when they when it went off, yeah, I, I can't do that sound, but uh, <laughs> but it, you know, but it did that, and it had the uh, the same effect with kind of the electricity dancing between or ion energy or whatever it might be right. uh, between the droids that knocked them <laughs> offline, which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, so they get to Tora's room, and she's busy playing her game with the uh, gun, and also the <laughs> um, the buckets list has the uh, noted that it had the orange pieces. They went over like the front of the gun, kind of like toys do today. Yeah, right, right. Which yeah. was, I don't know, a nice touch. <laughs> uh, but they make off with her, and then Captain Doza quickly becomes informed that you know five droids were found disabled and Tora is missing. And I guess this was a D four Tora's droid that informs him of such, and so he orders this sweep of things. Yeah, he this- he immediately sends more droids after like droids were defeated. Just saying. You know, I had that thought, too, and I was trying to puzzle, trying to come up with a good explanation for that. And I, the, that's the only the security ex- they have. Well, the, there's that. The best the other, you know, the other excuse I came up with was that he, he didn't know why they were offline. Uh, it's not like they've been blasted to pieces. Yeah, that, you know, someone just tore through them. Uh, I'm with you, Taxes, though, because my first thought is like, well, there's five. I, and I guess the other thing is he's reacting to the news that his daughter's missing. Um, right. It's you know, a knee-jerk reaction. That's right. The first you know, thing you think of. Cragen, you know, said, "Hey, we're going to take something that's precious to him." Well, he, they nailed it. Uh, they got his daughter. So, um, you know, so I could see why he'd be panicked about that. But you know, Sonara contacts Cragen and says, "You, know, why didn't you tell me you're going after Tora?" And he say, he says, "Hey, look, you got soft. You become friends with these people, and if we told you what was going to happen, then you know, we're not." You know, we don't. We couldn't count on you to necessarily go through this plan, and he's absolutely right because earlier in this episode, um, when they were in Tora's room playing uh, the hologram game, you know, she made some remark about the security, and Sonara said, "I would increase it." <laughs> yeah, right. It's, right. Like, it's like you know, you you know, this is not enough. There, you know, she knew something was up, and it was almost her. It was kind of her trying to warn mm-hmm. Captain Doza indirectly through Tora. Right. Yeah, but uh, so Kaz and BB-8 run into Sonara as they're trying to track down these two mysterious figures and they figure out that Tor has been kidnapped and so Kaz is going to take off in the fireball and follow them and Sonara calls in basically to the tower but she's you know it's kind of an anonymous tip you know she doesn't identify herself and she says you know Tor has been kidnapped you need to get on this she and changed her name 
Well, she said this is the tower or this is the she said she doesn't even say a name. She said right. I can't remember exactly what she said, but she said this is the platform or something like that. This is she, Luke Skywalker. Scrambly Aces. She was about to say a name and then she thought better of it and she called it in anonymously. Right. Uh, so uh so the aces get scrambled, but they have no idea which direction Tora went, and the uh pirates end up sending their two speeders off in a different direction to throw them off the scent. Um so you know, I'm just gonna kinda combine some of these elements here so we can talk about it as a whole. But uh, Taurus fighting back against uh, Valak and Drell. You know, she's kicking, I think it was Drell, in the back uh, while they're in speeders. They get to a skiff. They get boarded on there. While Kaz is following the fireball, he can't fire back because he's afraid of hitting and hurting Tora. Uh, but she kicks Drell in the back, so it causes him to miss him once or twice. But the fireball does take a couple of hits. This poor ship, it just cannot catch a break. <laughs> uh, and then eventually they get to Kragen's Galleon, which... I don't know about YouTube, but I thought that thing was incredibly cool. Oh, yeah, definitely. It was just like, to me, it was like the steampunk version of a pirate ship. You know what I mean? It like yeah. coming out of like the fog like that. And it was just all cobbled together. And then you see Craig in with his, you know, like Captain Morgan kind of stunts going on. It was just it was awesome. Captain. Captain. What did you think of the uh, Galleon, <laughs> Texas? Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, you know, I don't know if it's... Um, I always felt like they were kind of spacefaring, but that galleon kind of made it feel like they were more uh, based on that planet, you know? Um, uh, I mean, it was good design and everything. I thought it was really cool whenever the ship, uh, whenever um, the fireball was heading towards it, and all of a sudden, like, all the cannons start opening up. It That felt very Star Wars to me, uh -huh. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he's like, whoa, you know what I mean? Uh so yeah, uh, and, and by the way, kudos to Kaz because it was still daylight. I think we started following the skiff, and uh, they were firing at him, and it turned to night. And he's still behind him. He's just you know steadily avoiding their fire. I mean, could you imagine how tiring that would be? Oh yeah, he spends yeah. a lot of time following them. But I absolutely love this galleon design. I mean, it, it's it continues the motif that they've used for all these pirate vessels where it's clobbered together with parts of other things and sure. I know the um, the resistance guy says you know the, the crow's nest is made out of a hollowed out AT um, uh, ST's foot uh, <laughs> and that and that you know when the command center of the of the ship is from an uh, is from an ad at if you look at it you can see uh, a Lambda shuttlecraft's wings attached mm -hmm. to the side and stabilizers. Yeah. I think it can do. I think it's. I think these pirates were led to believe that they focus a lot of their attention on uh, Cantonica uh, and Colossus, the Colossus station. But I do get the feeling that this thing is capable of spacefaring uh, as well. But huh. it does look like it, it, Jay, you nailed it. It is kind of a steampunk version of a pirate ship. It is uh, super cool. And it is a great, great design. I, I absolutely love this one. But um, so they get there with Tora and they get her on board the galleon and they, the First Order shuttle shows up and it's uh, Major Von Reg and a couple stormtroopers. They they depart the shuttle and they've got the payment for the pirates. But as they're handing it over, they open fire on the pirates and basically are there to quote, rescue <laughs> yeah. Tora. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the whole thing was a setup. You know, they basically wanted her kidnapped so that they could rescue her and prove to Captain Doza that they are a more valuable security asset than the aces are on this. And I don't know, clever plan, I suppose. What'd you, what'd you guys think? It caught me. Com actually, I don't know if I just wasn't like paying close enough attention, but it actually kind of caught me a little off guard huh. yeah. because I was a little surprised that that they actually did that because I just would have thought that they would have wanted to keep the pirates a little bit on a shorter leash, you know, than that. But they kind of really cut them loose in a big way. <laughs> hmm. I was not surprised at all. Uh, this is, like I said, whenever you're dealing with tyrants, they try to create emergencies all the time uh, because by doing that, it makes the people like feel like they have to turn to them. You know what I mean? Oh, look at all this bad stuff that's happening, but we can offer you security. You know, it's historically based. I mean, in, even in our Earth history. And so when they turned on him, I was like, yep, here it is. You know what I mean? Uh, they, they provide the peace. Yeah. Was it a risk? Sure. 
You know what I mean? But, uh, you know, it's, they, I don't know, it's enough of a, a benefit to where the First Order's going to take the risk. Like a forced codependency is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you both, uh, because we've known for several episodes this is what was going on. I mean, Kragen and the First Order have been working together. Uh, the First Order keeps saying, hey, keep attacking Colossus, keep attacking Colossus, so that they will have to ask us for help, because the aces aren't going to be able to control everything i my read on this was is that the first order got fed up with the pirates uh you know because they weren't being successful and then they started demanding more money and so it's like well why don't we just escalate our plans because doza keeps wavering and he's not going through you know he's not accepting their offer they made that offer how many episodes ago four or five Mm -hmm. uh and he hasn't taken them up on it and so they kind of did something here to force his hand Hmm. um Mm -hmm. and if I and upon further reflection, is like, well, how else would this work? Just because, you know, it is you could kidnap Tora and I suppose kill her, and then send Doza into a rage. But what is better to do that or to get his gratitude by returning his daughter to him? The latter. Yeah. 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 But uh, so, anyways, uh, you know, so the first order returns uh, Tora. And then uh, Monreg really pushes it. You know, it's like, you know, hey, you know, we're, we, we're, you know, we, we've been monitoring things. And so we were in a position to help. And you really could use our help. See how valuable we are. You know, nudge, nudge. We're, we're very helpful. I don't know how many different ways he said that. Uh, <laughs> and then he, then he left. He left stormtroopers there. He didn't give Doza a choice. It's like, yeah, we're going to leave some troopers here to help out. And, yeah, you know, yeah but like, you, I mean, they're just they're for you though. You you, you can tell them what to do. Um, it's yeah, does like I don't you don't need to have you don't need to do that. Yeah. Andre's like, no, we insist. <laughs> It'll be helpful, yeah. and uh, so they're really pushing this uh, now. And um, so, anyways, you know, Craig and Sonar talk. Uh, Craig says, you know, the first words betrayed us. The deal is off. So Sonar is just kind of left there, and then Cash shows up and says, hey, I came to check on you. And so now, uh, then he asked her about, hey, you know, I came down here the other night to talk to you and I started talking to a couple people and she plays it off that they were just salvagers. Mm-hmm. After which uh, Kaz and BB-8 talk and, you know, basically BB-8 says, hey, look, you know, she's lying. She's either, you know, with the pirates or working with them. And, and Kaz says, yeah, I know, you're right. She, mm-hmm. you know, she is. She's either one of the pirates or she's she's aiding them. And I don't know what it is. That was kind of heartbreaking. Uh, it was. You know, I, you know, he's developed this crush. He's he's matured a lot over the last several episodes and you know he's he hasn't exactly been on the up and up with everybody because he's a spy but at the same time i just it was i don't know i felt for him because of this betrayal yeah well two things with that i mean i really got to give some kudos to kaz on that one because you know he obviously knew she was lying and he was trying to give her an opportunity to come clean and you know tell him the truth and he kept it in check. You know, he could have let his emotions take over given how he felt about her and really called her out. Um, you know, but he didn't. So I think that's huge for him. Yeah. In his, his development as a as a spy and as a character. Yeah, but I think she kind of figured out he was he, he she knew he's on to her. You know what I mean? Do you think so? Yeah. Yeah. I mean the way the way he couched it and her reaction, it, it just felt to me like he was telling her, look uh, I know you're uh, you're kind of involved with stuff, and uh, you know I don't know why, but you're kind of not being involved. I, I took it like that, right? Mm-hmm. And what? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, but no, no, no. That's I didn't I mean to interrupt like. you. Go ahead. No, no, you did. But uh, okay. the <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to make sure you could finish your thought. Oh, go I ahead. know, I know. I'm just playing with you. So the. I, I don't know. I just kind of felt like, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I kind of felt like it was like. Hey, uh, I kind of know what you're about, but you didn't go all the way for some reason, so... And she's like, yeah, yeah, because she kind of knows, she knows what he's about, too, right? I think so. I think part of her, too, almost wants to come clean with him, but just doesn't it's not the right time yet so she's almost looking yeah yeah, she's looking for reasons to tell him and for reasons for him to find out but yet she doesn't want you know she's torn yeah so and it's obviously going to be 
going to be coming up here soon. But um, there are one so thing, many reckonings that are set to happen on this show. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because Kaz is going to eventually get outed as a member of the Resistance as a spy. Sonara is going to get outed as a spy. Uh, there may be a first order spy somewhere mm-hmm. <laughs> on sure. the station. Ooh. And uh, Sorry. so, anyways, what, what I think Miko? you know, <laughs> uh, uh, possible, uh, unlikely, but possible. Yeah. <laughs> Looks an orca. But okay, here's another thought that I had, and um, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I feel like there's been a lot of focus on pirates lately. I mean, we've got, you know, obviously in Resistance, and then we we just have this this new book with Hondo, Pirates Price. We've had the Cloud Riders and Enfys Nest. Um, I don't know. Do, do you guys feel like there's just all of a sudden been this focus on pirates? I feel like there's there's going to be like a pirate uprising. And of course, we've got Maz Kanata, who's the queen of pirates, as we know. Hmm. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, um, I think pirates are part of a bigger subcategory in Star Wars of scoundrels, uh, whether they be smugglers, bounty hunters, uh, you know, kind of the underworld element of you the are. whole thing. Yeah. So I'm not so sure that Memphis Ness was a pirate as much as she was a raider, which is true. A slightly different thing, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, but yeah, they, they've been a um, well. I, to your point, Jay, there has been kind of um, there's been a lot of stories that have focused on that have gone away from the focus of the Force and the Jedi and Star Wars right now, and mm-hmm. I think the pirates and scoundrels and smugglers and things like that kind of fit into that niche, and we are talking about the. Uh, the frontier mm-hmm. of the Star Wars world, which is this, mm-hmm. you know, the unknown regions, wild space type thing, which, you know, where Colossus Station is. And that would be a place that pirates would prey. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of like, uh, you know, we've talked about, you know, comparisons between Resistance and our own history when the, you know, you kind of had the New World and pirates prowling the Caribbean uh, because they could. There was no, there was not much in the way of established. Uh, military presence or authority there and they could get away with attacking merchants and things like that uh, which is what the First Order is banking on is that Colossus Station's out there on the frontier and they are prey uh, for people like pirates and Kragan and stuff like that that are looking to you know make a uh, make a buck off their hard work right good points very good points mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all right Art. well <laughs> we've uh, kind of used up our time here so why don't we go around the table and we can offer our final thoughts and grades Jay you have the floor well this is the first episode since we've come back from the break and the midseason trailer where I really feel like yes okay we've got something here and you know I feel like this episode pretty much had it all it had some intrigue it had um, some surprises it had some intrigue you know it, there was just a lot of stuff going on in this as well as some lightheartedness as well and um, so I feel like we're like I said we're starting to go in the right direction there's some really good first order action in this one um, and just a good variety in the storytelling overall so I'm going to give this one a B plus not quite an A yet but it's getting there hmm. okay that's interesting I am going to give it an A so, um, wait, maybe an A minus. Can't remember. Um, you know, it's fun. This was a fun episode. This uh, kind of took me where I was hoping it would go, you know, from so long ago. Uh, or at least in recent shows where we've talked about it. Uh, it's a little more serious. I mean, things are kind of happening now and it's propelling the storyline, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I guess that's where I'm going to fall on it. A minus. Um, this is, this might be my favorite episode yeah. uh, of Resistance so far. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about the Pirates Code a bit. I think I loved the way that, that they featured in this episode. Um, the writing was spot on. I loved Kaz's development in this. I was trying to figure out who the writer was for this episode. It's someone named, um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but Gavin Hignite, uh, perhaps. But You're doing good. Uh while I was looking for that, it turns out Dave Filoni voiced the Keldor in this episode. So oh. that was a nice thing to discover oh, there. Oh, all right. But um, but that makes sense because he's a big fan of uh, the Keldor and Plo Koon. But um, I, you know, I, I just think that they got everything right in this episode. They got the tone correct in this one. They put appropriate stakes on this. They um, 
they evoked emotion with this one. You know, they, I, I that moment when Sonara is trying to make the call, when she's torn about what to do, there was, um, you know, I had some empathy for her, and she was relatable in that instance. Um, not that I'm a pirate, but that you know, she was she was doing something. You know, she she didn't know what to do. She stuck between between a rock and a hard spot. You know, she was a pirate. She didn't, you know, that was the only way of life she know she knew. And now she's on the station and she's made real friends. She's found people that really care for her beyond what she can do to make credits for them. Uh, and just the way that this whole thing progressed, I was a little surprised by what the forced order did, which caught me by surprise that I was surprised. Hmm. Uh, so, um, you know, there was just there was a lot to like in this one. Uh, the visuals, the uh, we got to see the aces get out and do some stuff. You know, it was a small touch, but you know that they were fanning out to look for Torah. They got led astray by the pirates' antics, the the ship designs. Like I said, they just they just I think for me they hit it everywhere on this mm -hmm, one. So this mm -hmm. one this one gets an A, and I think it might be my favorite episode of Resistance so far. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our discussion of the Doza Dilemma. Before we go, what do you guys have going on that the Scoundrels can look forward to? Well, for me, right here on Starship Sabres and Scoundrels. And you can also catch my archived blogs for Coffee with Kenobi and my Core Worlds Couture fashion reviews. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much it for me. But that's keeping me busy and I'm just loving life. So, yeah. And you posted uh, an unboxing on our Instagram, didn't you not? Uh, recently? I did. Yes, it was um, the Pozu Ray Resistance, uh, or sorry, Ray Scavenger boat that I purchased from Box Lunch. Um, that Box Lunch is now carrying Pozu products, and so I was super excited about those. And so it's um, yeah, it's been getting a lot of great attention. So thanks, Scoundrels, for um, tuning in. And if you want to check that out, you'll have to check out the last episode of That So Wizard. It's episode seventy-two point two. Yes, and you can find me over on the Supreme with Scott Murray, uh, Jeff McGee, and Regina Davis. Uh, we just had an episode this week, but due to the Super Bowl and due to people being out of town, we're going to have another two-week layoff. So, yeah, yeah. If you'd like, just, you know, call Dennis, and he will uh, record your messages and send them to you. Don't do that. Um, as for me, Whoa. you can find my common reviews on RetroSap.com, and each month I'm talking Star Wars comics with Joseph J. Shepard on Jedi Journals, in between taking messages for taxes. Thank you. Uh, with the return of Discovery, my wife Beth and I are covering each new episode on our show Warp Trails, which you can find on the RetroSap podcast page. If you want to find us on social media, we are SQPod on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook. We are Facebook.com slash SQPod. You can email us at sqpodretrozap.com. You can follow Darth Taxis on Twitter at Darth Taxis. Jay is at Joyce Krebs, and I am at DJKBDR2. And a special thanks to Christopher Sean for following us this week. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, the voice is Welcome. Has himself. All right. Speaking of RetroZap, we are a proud part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. The network currently features more than a dozen shows covering everything from retro gaming and movies to the Animaniacs collecting Dune collecting dune game of thrones and of course a whole lot of star wars you can subscribe to the network feed and get them all in one place that'll do it for this scoundrel special edition we'll talk to you all soon with another edition of starship savers and scoundrels until then may the force be with you